Hi guys, it's Jenny. Alrighty, so this is the second part of the video regarding orchids and flower spikes. If you missed the first part, I will add an info card right here. You can click on it and watch the first part and then continue with the second part or you can just stay on this video. So alrighty, let's continue the discussion with some Oncidiums. Now this is the Oncidium which was very very sick. I did quite a lot of, not quite a lot, but I did make a video on how to save Oncidium orchids on this guy and he was the perfect example of a very sick orchid. I had to cut the flower spikes he had at the time so I didn't really enjoy the blooms but I can enjoy them now. Now with this guy it actually took a year and a half and a pseudobulb which did not bloom for it to become comfortable enough and healthy enough to actually bloom. So with any type of orchid if you don't have success if it didn't bloom for a year and a half or two years it's not really a long time in terms of orchid life. I've had quite a few viewers telling me that their Oncidium orchids did not bloom for a year. Well, that's not surprising. One year is kind of like one month, uh, something like that in the world of orchids, so just be patient. Or some Oncidiums that didn't bloom for the past two years. Again, that's really not surprising. Some Oncidiums do take quite a lot of time to adjust to your environment. Maybe they're coming from a totally different environment than yours. You cannot know, you don't know exactly what type of care they received in the nursery because you don't know where the nursery is. It might be in Malaysia or Thailand, it might be in Europe, in the Netherlands, you don't know. And uh, the climates kind of change, so if you have something from a totally different climate coming into your climate, it can actually take two or three years for an orchid to properly adjust. There's always the case when you get a sort of a faulty hybrid or a faulty individual, this is how I like to call them, which are just not prone to blooming. Sometimes you get those. This usually happens when you get orchids coming from seeds. Now with seeds, you can have the fortunate luck to have a more fragrant orchid, a more beautiful orchid, or a faulty orchid. For this reason, sometimes I do prefer clones. If I'm looking for something in particular, I'm gonna buy a merit stem or a clone of an individual plant which has some qualities. If I'm up for risks, I can buy seeds or orchids coming from seeds, better said. Doesn't really matter. So usually when I order orchids, I do check if they're meristems or, you know, hybrids because they differ a little bit. So with Oncidiums, the first thing that comes into my mind when you're asking me why it doesn't bloom is one, is it adjusted to your climate yet? Two, is it healthy? Because this guy obviously was not healthy enough to produce a flower spike last year. And three, is it a hybrid which used to bloom for you and then it stopped? Or it kind of never did very well in the sense of prolific blooming for you. If it's that case, maybe you don't have a particularly good individual. And maybe you can actually invest in another one. Alrighty, let's talk some Dendrobium nobilis right now. A few days ago, I was having a discussion with Fifi here on YouTube. She also has a channel, you can visit her here. And she was saying that she always reads or hears this expression that Dendrobium nobili orchids need a winter rest starting from September or October until February. Or easier said, starting from Halloween to Valentine's Day. And she was asking me if I agree to this because she finds it pretty wrong. And I said, well, you are very correct. It's the most wrong thing to say. And I'll show you what I mean. So right now it's one week after Halloween and I'm sorry I didn't film this earlier, but there you go, my Dendrobium nobilis are already producing buds. They're quite far along. So pretty soon they will need to get out of the winter rest. They're actually out of the rest. I'm already starting to water them more frequent right now. Now what do I do now? Because articles tell me I need to start winter rest on Halloween. Do I start the winter rest now? No, obviously not. So I'll tell you what happens. Not only your climate will dictate when this orchid will go into dormancy and when you should provide the winter rest. And I will give you a very obvious example. Excuse me for it. Maybe it's way too obvious, but I want you to understand what I mean. So alrighty, the articles say you should give the winter rest from October or Halloween until springtime. But if you live in Australia, it's pretty spring right now there. So does it mean you should start to provide the winter rest now? No. That's not how it goes. Now, as I was saying, this is very obvious, but there are other more subtle things happening with climate. So, for example, there might be a climate in which proper temperature drops might start in November or December, or other climates like mine where temperature drops start to appear in September. So not only your climate will influence when your orchid needs to rest, but also your growing conditions. And I'll give you my example for this. 
So my balcony is glassed in and it also has a southern exposure. This means that whenever it's sunny, my balcony gets really warm. So even if it's February or March and outside temperatures are very, very low, my balcony will have pretty summery temperatures because of the sun heating it up. And that kind of gives a boost to my dendrobium nobilis. So pretty much in that time, they will start to produce new canes. Obviously, they will finish growing their new canes by September or even August. And this is why my orchids are actually starting to bloom much faster than other orchids. Let's call it like that. So if you have a growing space which has this benefit of actually starting warm temperatures earlier, your dendrobium nobilis might actually start to form buds earlier and they might need their rest earlier than other dendrobiums. However, if you don't have the same conditions, your dendrobiums might start their winter rest later on. So the best thing to do in this instance is let the orchid tell you when it will stop growing new leaves, it's time to reduce fertilizer and start going into that rest. Even if you don't have very low temperatures just yet, you can stop fertilizing, just let the orchid tell you when it kind of needs water, pretty much reduce watering because it will not consume that much water, and so on. So this can happen at the end of August, this can happen in December. It all depends on your climate and on your growing space actually. Another question that I usually get about Androbium nobilis is what to do with those orchids which are off-season. So because orchid nurseries, commercial ones at least, induce blooming into these types of orchids, it's kind of easy to induce blooming, you might find Androbium nobilis in bloom in full summer. So when autumn comes, when temperatures drop in your area, this orchid might actually be in full growing mode. What do you do then? Do you give the winter rest? And actually, no, you should not give the winter rest right then because all you're gonna do is deprive the orchid from moisture and from nutrients and the new canes will not grow properly and so on. For this reason, I kinda tend to prefer buying these types of orchids in the springtime. It's kinda important to have them in season because winter is not a proper season for these orchids to grow new canes. Days are short, also temperatures might be low, they're gonna suffer a little bit until they actually find their rhythm and start to adapt to your new environment. So you might have issues with non-blooming orchids for a while until they figure out the seasons and so on. So if you have a Dendrobium nobili which is actively growing in the autumn and winter, try to provide warmth and to provide light and fertilizer and water and so on. And in time, your orchid will actually start to figure out what season it is. It might have a period where it will not grow anything. It might not bloom so well for a year or two, but eventually it will find its rhythm. You just have to have a little patience with it. So again, for this reason, I tend to prefer to buy spring blooming orchids in the spring, not necessarily in summer or autumn, because there is a adjustment period afterwards that can be quite stressful. Okay, here we have the Tolumnia orchids. I have two of them in spike. Oopsie. Let me show you one up close. If I don't damage them, we're fine. So here we have a Tolumnia flower spike. As you can see, it's going to be much taller than the flower, than the plant actually itself. And this is one of the traits with Tolumnias. You can have a tiny little plant and a huge flower spike. Now this will be the first flower of these orchids, and first flowers are never super impressive. Now as far as I can understand, the flower spike can actually branch out as well, pretty much like a Phalaenopsis orchid. So how do you manage to get flower spikes from Tolumnias? Well, I can only attribute it to bright light yet again. These orchids have set right here, have set right here, sorry, in my brightest corner, and if you can see, they have a reddish hue to their leaves. This is pretty normal, this is what you're actually looking for. They're not burned, they're just receiving enough sunlight. And I really do believe it's a major factor if you want to rebloom your Tolumnia orchids. Give them bright light and of course give them moisture but do let them dry out in between. I will actually make a care tutorial on these guys when they will be in full bloom and I'll tell you everything uh, there is to know with them because I don't know, you know how some orchids are open books and some orchids are not? Well, these guys are kind of open books. I think they're really easy to keep, they're really easy to grow, they're not fussy, and they absolutely like bright light. And pretty much that's all you need to know about them. But I'll make a care tutorial with them when they're gonna be in bloom and I can show you some beautiful flowers. Alrighty, let's switch to the crowd favorite, the Phalaenopsis orchid. I have 
a lot of comments on Phalaenopsis orchids. So, you know that I made that video on how to induce blooming on Phalaenopsis orchids. This is one of those orchids which actually requires a little trick if you want it to bloom. And this is the day and nighttime temperature difference. Particularly, it really likes to have lower temperatures during autumn time or the beginning of winter for it to produce a flower spike. And this actually works. It has been tested so many times by me. I do live in a climate which actually has autumn spot on. When it's September, temperatures drop. I'm just lucky in that department, so I can understand why some of you guys who live in a warmer climate have some trouble blooming Phalaenopsis orchids. Now, the flower spikes usually come from between the leaves. You can have one flower spike or two flower spikes. Uh, I actually had a few questions on this. I don't think you can actually induce two flower spikes other than provide good care, good conditions, fertilizer. These guys do like their fertilizer. Other than that, it's just up for the genetics of your orchid. And of course, if it produced multiple leaves during that year. If it produced two leaves, you might actually get two spikes. If it only produced one leaf, it might not have the space to produce two flower spikes even though it would. Let's call it like that. So the more leaves it produces, um, the more available eyes, let's call them like that, it will have to produce multiple flower spikes. I have also had a few questions regarding basil keikis. When will they bloom? Now I have here an orchid with a basil keiki. This keiki is one year old and behold it has a flower spike. Funny enough, my orchid only produced one leaf this year because it put all its energy into this keiki so the mother plant doesn't seem to have any flower spikes <laughs> because i'm not sure if she has energy or available eyes but the keiki does have available eyes so you can actually get the surprise that a keiki whether it's a basil keiki or a spike keiki can actually bloom the following season it doesn't always happen some keikis bloom within two years it's again a genetics thing or a development thing but it's not uncommon for keikis that are one year old to produce flower spikes. Alrighty, and to finish up, let's talk some Kalia orchids. Now, Kalias are really funny creatures. They're my favorites, actually. They can surprise you in so many ways. And when it comes to flower spikes and buds, now that's a department where they can always surprise you. So if you know my previous video on this Kalia, you know that this growth was a little bit mutilated by the side of the pot, but it still bloomed. Now with Catlias, you can have those hybrids or species which do not produce a sheath. Usually when the leaf of a new cane opens, you can actually see the buds formed already. They can be smaller than this, but they're there. So I think this is one of my favorite types of Catlias. They seem to bloom faster than the other ones. But this is a particular case. There are also those Catlia hybrids that produce a sheath and whenever they don't produce a sheath you can have the bad luck of actually having a tiny little bud that will die on you. Funny thing with the sheaths, you can actually have Calia orchids with green sheaths that will bloom right away and you can have Calia orchids with dried sheaths that have been there for a year or so that will bloom at some point, pretty much like a Brassavola orchid. No wonder they're related. So with Catlias, I really don't think there is a pattern. And whenever you ask me, why doesn't my Calia bloom? I can tell you, one, it might be a light issue because Calias do enjoy bright light. But also, second, it might be a patience issue. Some orchids, some hybrids or species do require patience. They take their sweet time with the sheaths to bloom. But it's never a good idea to give up on the sheath and actually cut it. I don't see why you would cut it. So for those viewers who actually asked me if it's a good idea to cut dried sheaths, why would you cut them? Like, Do they bother you? Maybe they do visually, but the reward might be greater than that. So don't cut the dried sheaths, you never know. Okay everyone, I hope you enjoyed this video and it gave you some new tips. We can actually talk all day about flower spikes, flowers, what orchids do, but some stuff are better left unknown because, you know, it's always nice to have surprises. So I hope you enjoyed these two videos. If you did, give it a thumbs up and a share. Subscribe to my channel for daily orchid videos and feel free to leave me questions or suggestions for videos you might have in the comment section below and I'll get back to you. If you click on the left side of your screen, you'll be directed to orchinature.com where you'll find care sheets, identification sheets, and also you can talk to us in the forum section. And on the right side of your screen, you can click to watch another orchid video. Thank you for joining. I'll see you next time. Bye!